Say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You, are you awake today? Yes. Good. I want to uh, just encourage you as you're considering and asking the Lord what you should give um, towards missions. I want to encourage everybody just to jump in in some way. Um, I, I, I cannot under uh, uh, tell you what the significance is in, in the reach of hope in regards to missions, both locally and around the world. In fact, uh, not this week, but next week, a team of us are going to the Congo. I'm going to the Congo. Can you believe it? First time to Africa. And um, really excited about that. Tresor, who was here with our uh, Mission Sunday last year, he spoke, um, is doing a powerful work there. And uh, we've got 10 of us going. Um, and he just texted me just a couple days ago and said, um, one of the things that we're doing is we're doing a retreat for all of their leaders um, from all their hope centers from different cities all over Congo are coming to one place, and this team of 10 of us are going to pour into these leaders. How many say that's a pretty special moment? Um, just pour into these guys that are pouring out, refreshing, do some teaching, um, have some time in the presence of the Lord with them. And um, he just told me that the, the commitment that he had had from someone else that would fund that retreat um, they weren't able to complete the commitment because of a job thing. And um, so he just said, pray about it. And, and we want to be able to help with those funds. Can I hear an amen on that? And so when you give an offering like this, as those moments arise, we're able to help fund those things that come up. There, there are missions things that we commit to throughout the year, um, missionaries all over the, the world, really, um, that where we see kids fed that would not eat, where we see um, the Bible translated to languages that do not even have a word for God. I mean, there's all these commitments that we have all over the world. But then there's also these things that come up where people need things, both locally and internationally. And an offering like this um, gives us the, the opportunity to jump in when God says, hey, be a part of that. So as you're giving today and you're, 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 you're pouring into that, I want to tell you, it's going to make a real difference. Amen? All right. Well, happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, today, I had not planned on talking about this when we planned the missions um, uh, offering, but today we're going to spend our time talking about stewardship and giving. Yeah, I'm so thankful for the woos over in this section. Uh, one of the most important realities of our life is that we have been made stewards over what God has given us, um, which is all of your life. Your life is a gift from God. Your life is a gift from God. Um, you are a gift. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you are a gift. You are a gift. And every good and every perfect gift comes from above. Um, from the Father, from God. And we know this, that in 1 Corinthians 6, it says this, Paul says that you're not your own, that you have been bought with a price, which was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So if you are in Jesus, um, you're not only a gift, you're not your own. You're not your own. So turn to somebody, I know you love this, tell them you're not your own. You are not your own. Some of the wives are like, you're mine. And you're, you're his. You are not your own. And the truth is, you are a steward. You are a steward. And uh, I, I love this word stewardship. Um, and, I, and I came across this definition of stewardship. And it's this. It'll be on the screen behind me. Um, it's to manage, protect, and expand the resources of another. I want to say that again. Stewardship is, is to manage, protect, and expand the resources of another. We've been given stewardship of the life and the resources that God has given to us. Our time. You're a steward of your time. You can spend your time in a really productive way or an unproductive way, right? You're a steward of your days, that you've been given. You're a steward of your, of, of your family, of relationships. We're, we're a steward of the influence that we've been given. Remember, how many, how many have influence? Okay, you didn't learn last time. How many have influence? Everyone has influence. You get to steward the influence that you've been given. And also, a big part 
of stewardship is money. It's money. How we steward our money and our resources really, really matters. Can I hear an amen on that? Yeah, so some of you are like, oh no, he's talking about money. Yes, I am. And if, if you've been around here long enough, um, you probably would say he doesn't talk about it enough. In fact, I think I've only talked about it one time. And I'm sorry for that because it is important that we talk about money. How we steward our money really, really matters. Finances really matter. You're like, he talked about sex and now he's talking about money and what will be next? I don't know. There are nearly 500 verses in the Bible about faith. I think there's um, more than 500 verses on prayer. But when you look at it, there's actually over 2,000 verses regarding money and possessions in Scripture. That's a lot. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables. I, I read this the other day. In the Gospels, there's an amazing one out of 10 verses that deal directly with money. That's something like 288 verses um, in all of just the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that talk about money. There is an emphasis in Scripture on finances and money. I need you to smile at me today. Can you just be intentional? Because some of you are looking mad. I can see it. You're like, here we go. The fact is, though, that our use of money is about the most reliable external indicator of where our heart is. Um, how do we know that? We know that because Jesus said it. He said this in Matthew 6, 21, where we've been in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we are going to talk about this today. Just to be clear, I'm not talking about um, finances and money today, stewardship, because the church is hurting financially. We are not having a problem paying the light bill. Um, oh, we're not, you know, we're not, tithes and offerings have not gone down, thank the Lord. Um, I'd never want to speak into that um, issue motivated by any kind of negative I'm speaking about finances, and I'm talking about stewardship today because it's a central theme in the kingdom of God. And as your pastor, I want every single one of us to be blessed, and I want every single one of us to enter into all that God has for us in every single way of our life, and that includes in the realm of finances. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, in that same section, the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, we know that passage. We, we, we probably memorized it as, as, as a kid in Sunday school. But what Jesus is doing here is he is giving us a clear definition of God's purpose for our lives on the earth. What is that? We are here to seek the establishment of the kingdom of God. Amen. We are here to seek his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And it's really important to understand this, that when he said this, seek first the kingdom, he said it in the context of teaching on money and finance. That's the context for where he says that. We throw that around in a lot of ways, and it does apply really, to all of life, but it certainly applies in the realm of finances. Because Jesus, here when he says this, he has just instructed his disciples in verse 20 not to store up treasures on earth. He's just instructed them that they can't serve God in money in verse 24. And he's just urged them to stop worrying about how they're going to have their needs met. And then he says that. Jesus has money in mind when he says, seek first the kingdom. And what he's getting at is that we are to give ourselves first to his kingdom, and he will take care of all of our financial needs. This is the truth. Um, in Matthew 25, which we're going to be here for a bit today, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, Jesus shares a parable 
about the kingdom of God. And um, what we know about in parables is our parables are like pictures he gives us about what the kingdom of God looks like. Um, No one parable paints the whole picture, the full understanding of, of everything, but each parable helps us grow and understand the realities of the kingdom of God. And many times in his teaching, Jesus will t- start out the parables like this. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. And so here in Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching us how stewardship works in the kingdom of God. So we're going to jump in here in, in verse 14. And he says this, talking about the kingdom. Jesus says this, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants And entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Can we say that out loud together? To each, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Verse 16 He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. In other words, he grew what God had given him. He doubled what God had given him. So also, he who had two talents made two talents more. So he doubled what God had given him too. Verse 18, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, I think as we look at a parable like this, it's important for us to understand the largeness of this, that, that one talent was um, around 20 years' wages. I, I dug into this. There, you know, there's a little bit of variation in, in, in how much all of this was. But um, what, what I saw was about 20 years' wages is a talent, like half a year's lifetime um, of salary. So two talents was about 40 years wages, and five talents was about 100 years wages. How many would love 100 years wages? Yeah, yeah, woo, yeah, let's, glory. (laughs) Let's say, let's say, uh, uh, let's say you make 50,000 a year, okay? Some of you make less, some of you make more. You do the math. Um, The one talent, if you made 50,000 a year, would be about a million dollars you got. Two talents, two million, you can, you can add it up, five million, it's like five million. Or five talents, five million. Um, but the bottom line is these guys were entrusted with a lot, a lot of resource, okay? Verse 19 says, now after a long time, everybody say a long time, a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So Jesus is letting us know here that there will come a day for the settling of accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward. Can you imagine this moment? Bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 22. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I've made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, a little different story here. He says, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. He says, so I was afraid. Can you say that aloud with me? He said this, I was afraid and I went and hid. I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Now this 
This one talent man had no reason from what we know in this parable, in this story, to, to know the master as a hard man, to know God as a hard master. In fact, he was e- extremely generous to this man by giving him the one talent, right? I mean, he gave him a million bucks, basically, if he made 50000 a year. God is extremely generous. Can I hear an amen on that? God is extremely generous. He, ge- he gave him a million bucks, 20 years wages, and it says it took him a long time What does that mean? God is patient. God is patient. And yet, this man who was given the one talent has a wrong view of God. He has a wrong view of God. He says, I knew you to be a hard man, and I was afraid, and I hid. I was afraid, and I hid. Does that sound familiar to anything else? I was afraid, and I had hid. Adam in the garden, right? I was naked and afraid. So what did I do? I hid. God says, who told you you were naked? So here this guy, this one talent guy, is believing his master to be a hard man. In other words, he didn't trust him because he was afraid of him. Tozer says this, what, what, you, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. I'd like to say this, what you, what you believe about what God says about you and what he says about your finance is the most important thing about your finances. I figured I wasn't going to get shouted down today. It's okay. I'm prepared for that emotionally. I told myself. Here's the thing. Wrong views and lies that we believe about who God is almost always result in us being afraid, in us hiding in some way, and not becoming and not releasing all that he intended from our lives. And it's true in the realm of our finances and what we do with our money. So what we believe about God determines what we're going to do with what he has given us. And we see that in the parable. So he says to the master, here, have what is yours. He hands him back, you know, the talent, the bag of gold, whatever, exactly how he'd received it. Verse 26, but his master answered him and said this. He has a different response. He says, you wicked and slothful servant. That's pretty intense, isn't it? I mean, this, this guy didn't go and blow the money. I mean, he didn't go buy a boat, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't go on a European vacation. It's not, it's, it's not like he went on a shopping spree. He gives it back to him the way that he received it, and yet the Lord says, you're wicked and you're lazy. Why? I believe it's because of this. There is no neutral in the kingdom, There is no neutral in the kingdom. There is no staying where you are. There is either advancing or digressing. There's always a response required to stewarding what we've been given. There's always a response. So you're breathing today because he said you could breathe today. There is a response that he's looking for in you. As we just put it in worship terms like we were worshiping. We give you all the glory, right? We worship you. Well, yeah, we can be really casual about that. Or we could be like, man, the breath in my lungs today is so that I can lift up worship to God. It's about all of life, right? We're just talking about finances today, but it's in everything. There's always a response that is required to steward what we've been given. Verse 26, the master says, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money. The talents are about money. Invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. The least you could have done was put it in a bank. Verse 28, so take the talent from him, the master says, 
and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. Everybody say abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Sobering, isn't it? God is serious about what he entrusts us with. I want to say this. So often we think about, you know, we have to have a lot, but don't think what you have is too little based on somebody else and what they have. The challenge is be faithful with what you've been given. The guy who was given two and the guy who was given, you know, uh, five were both given the same well done. They were given the same well done. It's not about the amount you've been given, the amount you have. It is about the stewardship and the faithfulness to what you've been given. You know, somebody could give a million dollars to the church and somebody, you know, a, a, a widow could be dropping in her last five dollars that she has for the week. And do you know what? God sees it as the same. In fact, in some instances, depending on you know, everything with the guy that gave a million and, and, and what that re- represented, he could be more pleased with the widow's offering. And what we need to understand, I think, today is this. This is what I want you to hear. And some of you are like, this is really basic. But how many know we need the foundational basic stuff? Everything you have is from God. Everything you have is from God. He is the owner you are not the owner. In America, we're like, I'm the owner. He is the owner. We are not the owner. Everything we have comes from God. He gave it to you. Think about it. Your house, it's his. Some people argue with this. Your house is the Lord's because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He gave you that house. Your car is the Lord's. Now, he may not have wanted you to buy it because it was too expensive, but you did it. It's his. <laughs> He's like, I can't claim that. You paid too much for it. I'm kidding. Let's laugh a little, okay? Your bank account, your everything. And you and I are called to manage, to protect, and to expand what he has entrusted us as we seek first the kingdom of God. So it's not just about Um, What you'll do, you know, one day when you land that big job with that big salary. Oh, then I'm going to give. Or when you like win the lottery. Or you win a million bucks. You're like, oh, I'd give half of it away. Well, if you're not giving now, you would not give half of it away. I promise you. You you just wouldn't. Um, It's what will you do with what you have been given right now? Like right now, you think about what you have. I mean, don't run it too much in your mind because you'll get distracted, but what's in your bank account right now? What will you do with what you have? With the finances that you have right now, with the income that you have right now, you know, we often, we often miss how the kingdom works because we imagine bigger and better and, and, and um, you know, one day. But the kingdom of God comes in seed form. Little seeds. And he says, what will you do with what you have been given right now? Because when you're faithful over a little bit, man, he will set you over much. So if you aren't faithful with $500, why would he give you $5,000? This is so popular. (laughs) This is the way that God has worked from the very beginning in the garden. Okay, what, what do you think of when you think of God's first command in the garden to Adam? I think a lot of people would, would think, don't eat from the tree. That's what people think of. That was the first command. That wasn't God's first command. If you think God's first command to his first man is don't, it'll impact who you know God to be. Right? Guess what? God's first command is blessing. His first command is blessing. Genesis 1.28. These were God's first words to man. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply 
and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to tell you today, this has been God's desire from the very beginning to bless his people, to bless you and to bless your life. And we have to refuse every other thought that doesn't line up with this truth. You know, if Adam believed God's first command, he would never have been tempted with his second. I'm going to say that again. If Adam believed God's first command a blessing, he would never have been tempted with his second command. When we walk in God's divine order, there is blessing. And I'm... Hear me on this. If you've been around here, I don't even need to say it, but some of you are new. I'm not talking about some name it, claim it, prosperity gospel, okay? I'm not talking about you getting rich in this world so you can uh, fill yourself with all the pleasures of this life, okay? That is not what we're talking about. We preach Jesus, him crucified. That's not the story of the New Testament, okay? I'm talking about us walking in divine order, I'm talking about us um, living in the blessing of the kingdom of God through faithfulness. If Adam had walked in God's yes, he would never have had to walk in God's no. See, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden and God says, hey, eat of all of these trees, any tree you want except the one. That one tree, that's mine. And what did that mean? Every time that Adam was walking by that tree, you know, you know what he was going to realize? He was going to realize, I don't own this garden. God owns this garden. And what he would realize is that, that I'm not here as the owner of it. I'm here to tend his garden. And I'm here to steward it. And I'm here to grow the garden. See, if you saw your life and your finances, that is that your, your life is to worship him. And that includes you're here to manage, protect, and expand the resources of another. You would align into the kingdom of God being first in your life. Right? God puts one tree in the garden to remind them that they're not the owners. I bless you. I give you all of this. Be fruitful, multiply. What happens? Satan comes, right, with the first temptation and says, says, God doesn't want you to eat that tree because you'll be like him. In other words, eat the tree, eat of the tree, and you'll be an owner. You'll be in charge. It's all yours. It's it's your money. (laughs) Are you following me? No one gets to tell me what I do with my money. No, no, you won't have to. You won't have somebody telling you what to do. You won't be a steward anymore. And they fell because they were not content to be stewards. And this is the age-old problem. God cares very, very, very much about stewardship. So much that if it was his plan from the beginning, I want to tell you, it's still his plan. It's still his plan. So I want to to talk about just giving and tithes and offerings and sacrificial giving. And I I don't know how much I'll get to it, but Robert Morris, I've said this before, has this book called The Blessed Life. And I read it years ago. It really has influenced me in so many ways. I encourage you to read it. Um, So much in that book that's that's even influenced a a part of what I'm sharing today. Um, But just so we all know, I know many of you know this, the tithe is the tenth, right? Is the ten percent. And in that 10%, it represents everything. It represents the 100. It represents the the other 90. It's the first. And what is that? It's the first dollar you spend. So if your paycheck is $100, how much is the tithe? If you make 1,000, the tithe is? Yeah, you're kind of quiet on this today, guys. I I feel this. You're like, where is this guy going? It's going to get better. You make a million dollars, it's 100000 right? If you give 50, but you made 1000 that's not a tithe. We see the principle of the tithe even in the Garden of Eden. 
just like we just saw, God says, you have access to everything here in the garden except one thing. The tithe, some, some think it originated you know, with the Mosaic law. The tithe didn't originate there. The tithe actually originated with Abraham in Genesis 14. Just a little background, I think it's important. Abraham gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, the priest of God. Uh, that whole idea could actually be a whole message in itself because there's so much in that, but I'm, I'm not going to spend time there today. We see in Genesis 28, 22, Abraham's grandson, Jacob. You remember Jacob? Jacob has this experience with God and says, surely the Lord is in this house, house and he tithes. That's what happens. Verse 22 of Genesis 28, 22. This is what he says. He says, and of all that you gave me, I will give a full tenth to you. So Jacob, Jacob's vow to tithe came out of his grateful heart. How many know that any giving should come out of a place of gratefulness and thankfulness? It didn't come from a legalistic mindset. It came from a heart of gratefulness to bless the Lord. And I think it's, it's really important to realize that, that, that the tithe um, began 400 years before the law. So file that one, okay? It's in Exodus 13, the Lord says to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn set apart for me. You know, all that first opens the womb, whether it's an animal or it's a male, they shall be the Lord's. That's what he said to Moses. Exodus 23, 19, I think we've got that one. He says this, the best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. See, God was giving instructions to the Israelites on how to prosper in the land of promise. Leviticus 27.30. Here's another one. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's, and it is holy to the Lord. So he says, the tithe is the Lord's, and it's holy. And when we really get this reality, here's what happens. You would not want that 10% left in your bank account. You would never want to spend that on anything other than giving it to him through worship to him. Because why? It's the Lord's. And it's holy. So we have to realize this. Everything we have is from God. You say, no, no, I did that. I built that company. You say, no, 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 I, I went to school. I worked hard. I did all of that. I'd ask you, who gave you the ability? Who gave you the ability? Who made you smart? Who made you medium smart? <laughs> right, like, who gave you the ability? That, who, who decided you'd be born in a successful nation? God. God did. Everything you have, he gave you to steward. And what he's saying here is he's saying, he's saying, set apart the first of what you earn. It's mine, and it's holy. It's holy. To me, the tithe is an opportunity. The tithe is an invitation. We get to tithe. Can I say it like that? We get to tithe. It's a form of worship. If, if you have something to give, it's because God gave it to you to be able to give. We're blessed that we get to do this. See, this isn't about having to do it. It's about we get to do it. It's an invitation. Some of you say, well, that's Old Testament, Josh. Well, first of all, the Old Testament is the Bible. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to that in a minute, okay? But before we get to some New Testament stuff, let's turn over to Malachi chapter 3. It's probably the most popular passage on this. And uh, the Lord, I'm, I'm here to help you today, right? I'm not trying to get something from you. This is, I'm, I'm bringing this message out and it's between you and the Lord. 
right? And, and what I'm praying is that as this goes forward today, that the Lord would stir in your heart his voice would speak to you. And if you say, Lord, I want to hear what you want to say to me today, guess what? Everything, I'm not here to pressure you. How many are thankful you have a pastor that's not going to pressure you? This is, this is between you and the Lord, but I want you to know the truth of the word of God. Malachi chapter 3. The Lord is addressing Israel through the prophet Malachi. So Malachi isn't speaking here. Um, and guess what? I'm not speaking here. God is speaking here. His word to the Israelites. Malachi 3, 7. I love how the message opens it up. Then we'll jump to the ESV. It says this, God says this, you've had a long history of ignoring my commands. <laughs> you haven't done a thing I've told you. <laughs> Sounds like a parent. <laughs> Return to me. So I can return to you. <sighs> Do you hear that? Return to me. So I can return to you. Says the God of the angel armies. You ask, but how do we return? Verse 8. By, begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. Verse 8 in the ESV says this, but you say, how have we robbed you? He says this, in your tithes and contributions, your offerings. And he says, verse 9, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And here's how I'd like us to see this and hear this today, is that they were robbing God of the blessing of being able to bless them. Right? They, they were under a curse. Guess what? God doesn't want anyone to be under a curse. He's not willing that any should perish. That's who God is. God's a God of blessing, right? He's a blesser. They were robbing him of the opportunity of releasing blessing upon them. And so what does God say? He says, I don't want that for you. Return to me. I want to return to you. I want to bless you. And in verse 10, this is what he says. So this is what you do. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Till there's no more need. I, I, under normal circumstances, testing God is a sign of faithlessness. But in the case of the tithe, God actually allows Israel to test him. It is a test. It's a test. See if I will not open the windows of heaven over you and pour down a blessing. Verse 11. This is the second thing that will happen. I will rebuke the devourer so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. In other words, he's going to remove the obstacles of abundance in your life. And your, your, your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Guys, these promises are ours. How do we know this? Because just a few verses before he said all this in verse 6, he says, I am the Lord and I do not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the order of God. This is how God works. Now, these promises are not a way to try and manipulate or control God. Can I hear an amen on that? Our posture is never, hey, well, I did this. Now you have to do that. Like, I paid my tithes. I gave an offering. Now you have to make it rain, God. That's not how it works. Why? Because the moment it becomes a transaction, it's not generosity and it's not worship. And I'd even like to just say, doing it out of like, I have to, because some guy with a microphone told me is not going to be the right heart. Also, it doesn't mean if you have a five, you know, $500 to last you for the next 14 days and you go on a shopping spree and spend it all and then ask God to rebuke the devourer, I want to tell you that's not the devourer, that's called stupid. Right? Like, I mean, it, it just is. It's so funny, like, you know, overextending ourselves and then saying, God rebuke the devourer. 
He's like, you're the devourer. You're devouring your income. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> People say you can't fix stupid. I actually believe God can. I'm thankful he's fixed stupid things in me. And he does. Our tithes and offerings are not to control him. Hear me on this today. They're to trust him. They're worship and they're thanks to him. Thank you for everything that I have. Thank you that I'm, I'm, I'm alive. Thank you that I'm saved. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Some here might want to say, Josh, you know, we're not under the law. We're under grace. And I say yes and amen. Yes and amen. But many, many believers do not understand what grace is and how it operates. The righteousness of grace, get this, hear me. I know we're coming to a close here. I may not be, but... The righteousness of grace always exceeds the righteousness of the law. Because grace now empowers what you're willing to do. Think about this. In the Sermon on the Mount, we've been there for a while. Matthew 5. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And here's what we see is that every time Jesus points to an Old Testament law, he then sets the standard higher. under the new, te- new covenant of grace. What do I mean by that? I mean this. The law says don't murder. What does Jesus say? He says don't even get angry with your brother. The law says don't commit adultery. Jesus says don't even look at a woman with lust in your heart. So if you've taken the theology, I don't tithe because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, I say okay, then give according to grace. It'll be much more. Imagine us arguing with God when he's given us everything about 10%. I'll come to church and I'll sing, I will give you all my worship. But I'm going to argue with you about that much. Am I stepping on toes? Bless you. I love you. Come hug me afterwards. If you're offended by me, come hug me. We'll get rid of the offense. If we have a better covenant than they did under the Mosaic covenant, which we do, why would we give less? It's not logical. I mean, we have a better covenant. Let's respond in a better way. Guys, I have, I've overwrote for this. I close with this. Jesus warned the Pharisees in Luke eleven forty two. 42. He said this to them. He says, for you tithe mint, this is New Testament, and Jesus. You tithe mint, rue, and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. He says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Jesus is saying, he's saying to them, You've neglected justice. You've neglected love, mercy in other places, he he writes. You need to do these things without neglecting the other. Sometimes I'm like, Jesus, why don't you just say in the Gospels, my people tithe. (laughs) My church tithes. Why don't you just say that? And the confusion, all the confusion over it. I believe the reason he doesn't come out and say it that way is because it's a test. He says, test me. And then he's also throwing us a little, a little quiz, a little test. He's saying, they've got to trust me. And this is a test. Tithing, I believe, is a test. And it's just the beginning. 10% is set aside for God. What does that mean for my finances? It means that he is going to take care of them. And it will also mean adjustment. It will mean I have to adjust my life and adjust my priorities. I may have to reprioritize around seeking first the kingdom of God in my finances. What does that mean for my vacation? It might mean that I can't take one this year. Not popular at the beginning of summer, right? I'm not suggesting you shouldn't take a vacation. I hope every single person can go, 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 go. 
What does that mean for my wardrobe? It might mean wear it again. That's a good word for somebody. It will mean adjustments. Most people want the blessing without adjusting their life. When it comes to generosity, when it comes to stewardship, when it comes to giving, too many people won't change what they're doing. And how many know, if we want to come into alignment with God in all the areas of life, we have to adjust what we're doing to get in the kingdom and get aligned with kingdom priorities. But here's what I want to encourage you in. 90% with the blessing is far better than 100 without it. I close with this. I already said I'm closing. Charity, I'm really closing. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says this. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. No one can serve two masters, verse 24. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. See, money will try and rule you. The spirit of money, mammon, will try and insist that you worship it instead of worshiping the living God. Money isn't evil. How many like to have money? You're liars. I know you do. Money isn't evil. The love of money is the root of the evil. And the greatest weapon to be free from it is generosity. Every time I give, I declare, money does not control me. Try it. Every time you give, if you're feeling controlled by money, give. Take someone out to lunch. Give. Do something. Get rid of it and see what happens in you. That control will be broken over you as you give. What we do with what we've been given really matters. Given, giving is saying, Jesus is Lord. It's not just singing about it. It's saying he really is the Lord of my life. Stand with me this morning. We've got to go. Are y'all okay? Y'all going to come back next Sunday? Good. Here's the thing. The easiest way to tell if you're, if, to tell if you're serving God or money is to look at your bank statement to click on your app and look at it. And really look at it. Where does my money go? Where does my money go? I believe there's a call today to return to him and to to begin to put our finances first where we're saying, God, I want to seek you first in this area. I don't want to put anything over you. I want you to be first. Do you have your wallets with you? Grab your wallet. Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything weird. I promise. I don't have my wallet, but I have my phone, and it has Apple Pay on it. I just want you to grab, if you have a purse, grab your purse, grab your wallet, whatever it is. Truly, I'm not going to ask you to give anything, just so you know. But I would love for us just to close by holding our wallet, holding your purse, whatever it is, just before the Lord. And closing our eyes and just saying, Lord, here it is. Here's, here's what represents my finances, my money. And my, if it's your desire, just say, God, it's my desire to put you first. And for some of us, we may say, I don't even know how that could even possibly work in my current budget. As you're holding it there, I just ask that the Lord would begin to speak the ways and the details of how you can offer and honor him and to get in in sync with the order of his word on this. Just say, Lord, I offer up my finances to you. If that's your heart, just repeat that after me. Lord, I offer up my finances. 
I want it to be pleasing to you. And I want to seek your kingdom first in my finances. I want to be a good steward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. I love you. I love you. Don't leave here with a bit of condemnation. Leave here talking to Jesus about your finances. Talk to him about it. But don't come up with your own thing. Go back to the word of God. He loves generous givers. And ask him, how do I align myself with your word? God bless you. Have an amazing Memorial Weekend. We love you.